Well, hi there. It's time for VoiceOver Body Shop Tech Talk. And if you've got a question for us, throw it in the Facebook chat room. We've also got Clubhouse with us tonight. Finally learning about Clubhouse. And uh, and it's working for us. Sort of like being on uh, the old Larry King show. Larry King left us uh, last week. So uh, in yeah. Pittsburgh, you're on the air. Yeah. Anyway, a lot of fun doing that. So if you've got questions, throw them in there. And uh, George and I are going to talk about the stuff we have learned in the 10 years we have been doing this show. Probably more like in the 30 plus years he and I have been doing home voiceover studios. We'll talk about that. A little Top bit. five things each of us have and think learned. the thing that we picked up in the last 10 years. It's hard to, it's hard to remember. <laughs> Absolutely. All right. Stay tuned. Time for a voiceover body shop. Tech Talk right now. From the outer reaches, they came, bearing the knowledge of what it takes to properly record your voiceover audio. And together, from the center of the VO universe, they bring it to you now. George Widom, the engineer to the VO stars, a Virginia Tech grad with the skills to build, set up, and maintain the professional VO studios of the biggest names in VO today. And you, Dan Leonard. The voiceover home studio master, a professional voice talent with the knowledge and experience to help you create a professional sounding home VO studio. And each week, they allow you into their world, making the complex simple, debunking the myths of what it takes to create great sounding audio, answering your questions, showing you the latest and greatest in VO tech, and having a dandy time doing it. Welcome to VoiceOver Body Shop. Tech Talk. VoiceOver Body Shop Tech Talk is brought to you by VoiceOverEssentials.com, home of Harlan Hogan Signature Products, Source Elements, Remote Studio Connections for Everyone, VoiceActorWebsites.com, where your VO website isn't a pain in the butt. VOHeroes.com. Become a hero to your clients with award-winning voiceover training. J. Michael Collins demos when quality matters. And VoiceOver Extra, your daily resource for VO success. And now, live to drive from their super secret clubhouse and studio in Sherman Oaks, California. Here are the guys. Well, hi there. I'm Dan Leonard. And I'm George Whittem. I'm glad you remembered. And this is VoiceOver. Body Shop. Or VO. B B S Tech Talk 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 Anyway, uh, so George, you and I have been doing this show for exactly ten years. You know, the origins of it were you know people keep asking us about. Somebody actually reminded us last week. Says, you know, your show sounds like car talk. We're like. Yeah, that yeah. was the idea. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> ding, 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 ding. Yeah, I mean, if you think we sound like Car Talk, that was one of the, one of our uh, archetypal shows for how we decided to model this show. We we wanted to capture that kind of that jovial personality, the back and the forth, ba the back and the forth, and the forth, uh, and the and, and the, <laughs> and the, the thing after, and the right? that. <laughs> and uh, we wanted to keep it light and fun, but it's still extremely uh, topical and really helpful. So uh, I, that's how I always thought of car, car talk. I learned a heck of a lot about cars <laughs> listening yeah, right. to that show in the 20 years up until uh, they stopped the show. So, yeah. You know, I, I think the important thing that people need to really understand about what it is you and I do uh, when it comes to home voiceover studios is and especially since, you know, we both listen to car talk. And that's the idea of, you know, aside from teaching people how to do it properly, uh, it has to do with troubleshooting. And if you've got a technical issue, you know, I remember Mr. Soman, my power mechanics teacher in middle school, back when they called it junior high school, uh, explaining how do you troubleshoot a lawnmower and going through the thing. Well, if it hits this, it's that. If it's not this, then go on to the next thing. Go on to the next thing. When you've worked with so many different units and so many different setups and all those different things over many, many years, generally when someone says, I got a problem with this, Generally, we just were able to jump right into it and say, well, it's that. Although it helps if we actually hear it. Uh, a lot of times people will pay stuff on or post stuff on Facebook and it'll say, I got a hum or I got a buzz or I got something like that. 
It's like, well, is it a hum or a buzz? Because there's <laughs> yeah. actually a difference between those two. <laughs> or somewhere in the middle or both. Exactly. God forbid. Like, well, oh, it's, and it's fun when you said you've got, you know, you got two noise, you get two sources of noise in the background. You know, one's here and one's there. And it's like, well, one, what's one? Well, one might be your fridge. The other might be your, your neighbor's Harley Davidson. But, um, <laughs> you know, those sort of things happen. But if you really want to learn how to do a home voiceover studio right, or if you are having a problem with the one you have, like if someone says, you know, there's something wrong with your audio, it's not quite the way it should be. There's really only two places you can go. One is Mr. Whittem who's you know, over there. And <laughs> yeah, I'm over. Wait, no. The, the, over there. Over and you're over there. there. I don't, that's, and, and that's where I am. So uh, uh, you can go over to. <laughs> George the dot tech. That's where all my tech stuff is, where I can, uh, you can book support with me. I have an automated scheduler that works pretty darn well. Um, there are uh, self-service items like a sound check. Uh, that is, if you don't know what to do on my site, which is a common question, you have a lot of things. What should I start? Start with a sound check. At least let's find out how you're sounding to begin with. Um, but uh, there's a lot on there to check out. There's also a lot of free content, some 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 tutorial, training material, FAQs, uh, a blog, a lot of stuff I've accumulated over the many years that we've been doing this. But Dan does the same over at his place, and that's... Oh, there it is. Homevoiceoverstudio.com. <laughs> there it is. Yeah. Uh, you know, we as I as George was saying, we've been doing this a long time. And you know, and we're gonna talk about this in a couple of minutes. The fact that uh, you know, maybe we didn't know everything when we started, but we've seen it all since then. Uh so generally there's a there's a way to do things, but still every every voiceover studio, home voiceover studio is different because every voice is different, every room is different. And we want you to get it right. Uh, so if you go over to homevoiceoverstudio.com, as we were saying, we really do want to hear your audio. I've got my specimen collection cup there. If you scroll down to the bottom of the, the homepage and submit a raw file to me, because every time you know, people are like, well, you know, I add I've got a manly Vox box and I got this and I've got, you know, an Avalon preamp along with that. And then I add so a DBX 286 and then I use RX7 to clean up all that mess I made with the all the other stuff. And uh, I want to be able to hear the raw sound so we can get it clean up front. Uh, and if so, we can get your sound sounding the way it's supposed to sound or what it's supposed to sound like. Whistle. You know, I've been using that a lot lately. I'm glad to hear that. Indeed. And uh, I always give you credit. Thank you. I appreciate that as well. And I always give you credit when we talk about stuff that like, you know, George always says this. <laughs> you know, that's. And I think that's the great thing about our partnership with this show is we've had the chance to to really see everything that's happened out there. Uh, we've you know, when we first started the show, I mean, if people go back and look at episode number one, I mean, I was hoping maybe we could show it tonight. But if you go on YouTube, you'll find it. Uh, E-Web's EP number one, I think. And it's somewhat out of focus. My mustache is a lot darker. I think I actually have a little bit more hair. George has a few more pounds on him. It stopped and started uh, six or seven times, which we, we re-edited it back together for the YouTube. But, uh, yeah. Ten, ten years we've been doing that, this. And, uh, and the thing is, is we've learned a lot. You know, a lot of people say, well, you know, can you, how much can you teach me while I'm standing on one foot? Well, it's not going to happen that way. Uh, it takes time to really learn this stuff and, because we've been doing it a while, generally, we're the first place you should go if you want to learn how to do it or if you've got a problem or someone's saying you have a problem, uh, you know, we're the guys to go to because we have learned these things. So I, I challenge George to come up with, we're going to come for the each year we've been doing the show, uh, something that we've learned. So each of us have come up with five. So I figure we'll alternate here and I'll let you go first. What what have you learned from the time that suddenly you found your, you know, from going off movie sets when you were doing sound there and the other things you were doing into doing home studios? What have you learned? Probably knew this longer than 10 years, but this just seemed to be appropriate that the a lot of the booths that you buy come lined with acoustical foam Recurrent. and how often <laughs> that it is woefully inadequate to tune the sound of the inside of that booth. Foam just doesn't cut it in most cases in a voiceover booth. 
Um, you know, I, the very, very first voiceover booth I would have ever been inside of and really listened to was probably for Howard Parker 20 some, maybe 20 years ago in, in New York city. And, um, honestly, I didn't know any better, you know, and I don't think any of us did, you know, we just put up a 416 in there and he would talk into it like this and do movie trailers because, because he was eating the mic. We'd never really heard the room. We didn't really hear the acoustical issues. So foam is definitely a biggie if you're going to use foam it's got to be so thick at least four inches in, in most cases that you might as well it just takes up so much space so anyway i'm finding that foam is one thing that i've been trying to avoid in most cases whenever possible dan what is the first on your list first on my list and this it's the exact same also thing. acoustics yeah because it's so is important <laughs> is number one and i've always been saying it's like 90 percent of the quality of your audio yeah. Uh, and so many people try to cover up that stuff saying, well, I can fix it with this or I can fix it with that. You can fix it by getting it right up front. Uh, acoustics, you know, and acoustics is two different things. And people tend to get very confused about this. To us, acoustics is preventing exterior noise from coming in mm -hmm. and what it takes to do that, which is basically literally impossible. <laughs> uh, yeah. I, I mean, especially if you live in a noisy neighborhood or you're in the... Uh, the landing path of a major airport, or even a small one for that matter. Yeah. Um, it's very difficult to do, uh, but isolation is very, very important to prevent as much exterior noise as possible. If you can drop the exterior noise by like 10, d 10 to 15 dB, that may be enough to get you where you need to be. But the other part of acoustics is what we were just talking about, and that is internal reflection. And really, th and, and the things that I've learned about that is the louder you talk, the more the acoustics of the room come into play. Uh, because when you talk louder, suddenly you hear the rest of the room. But when you're talking the way you're supposed to, when you're doing voiceover from the proper distance from your mic and your levels are set right, which I'll get to you know, in a little bit, um, it should sound like you and nothing else. Uh, you, there shouldn't be any reflection. And how you do that, it takes individual tuning for everybody's voice. Everybody's voice and everybody's space. Exactly. That's right. Um, my second one is just about keeping it simple, which you've heard us talk about a million times on this show. Um, I keep hearing and experiencing it over and over with clients of all different stripes and levels of experience and income levels, et cetera, et cetera. The ones that often shock me with how clean the recordings are, really low noise levels, like below minus 70. Almost always, they are plugging a condenser mic into an audio interface. And that's it. That's it. There's no mixer in the board, in the string. There's no, um, or in the chain. There's no outboard preamp, no compressor, no et cetera, et cetera. No tube, of course, anything. Um, and uh, that is what's getting the cleanest recordings. And, and that is our noise is our enemy um, as sound quality bar goes up and up. I know some people think maybe it's gone down because of home studios, but I, I argue against that. I think the sound quality bar is staying or not going high, not going higher thanks to the video game industry. They're very, very picky about sound quality. Um, we are getting great sounding recordings with simple, simple systems. And so don't overthink how much gear you need. Don't overspend. Talk to us first. Yeah. Dan, what's I, next on your list? Well, I was I was going to comment on that is that, you know, when I first arrived here out in L.A. and started going into people's houses when we were still allowed to go into people's houses. Um, and, and you and I both do this as we go in there, we start unplugging everything. You know, it's like, you know, and they'd have all this stuff. I found that people were literally 10 years behind when I got here, as opposed to what you and I knew about what was going to keep things simple for people. And you unplug it and you uh, now listen to it. Oh, that sounds great. <laughs> yeah duh and anyway. no offense to all of our radio engineer friends because i've had my own radio background but a lot of the times those studios were installed or set up by a radio engineer who was trying to get a broadcast sound quality studio out of that's right we're on the air that's right it's a very <laughs> different thing yeah. uh my third one is uh mic placement and i know dan's going to talk about mic technique as always did we get to talk about that yet, Dan? Did I step on you about the mic technique? I, I, no, we I, already I, mentioned. I, I think, no, I didn't. Well, we talked about it a little bit, but that was my number two. Mic technique. This is dovetailing mic okay. technique, mic placement. Right. Uh, mic placement. I have found 
that as Dan said, as you back away from the mic and you provide, because when you're further away from the mic, you have to talk louder. When you talk louder and you're further from the mic, guess what? The room is much more of a factor. And I found that the mic placement situation in a lot of small spaces is a little bit different from what people are used to in larger spaces. So we've been using the that classic Hang 10 thing. There's still a picture on Google from Dan Friedman. If you, if you look online, you'll see this picture of Dan with the mic. You know, it's that is not a wrong suggestion, but I find that it is not working quite as well in a lot of really small studios, especially with low ceilings. So that is something that I don't even think I quantified really well until a couple, uh, last a couple of years, actually. And um, I found that, you know, you really have to work your mic placement very carefully when you're in a really small space. The sweet spot that you have to work with is quite a bit smaller. Yeah, yeah, just just a fist, you know. You know. I, I, and of course, I, we've you always, have a big space about you. Yeah, well, I've, I'm, I have a big space out here in the studio because, yeah. you know, because we also do the show out here. At least high we're, ceiling. We're doing, yeah, high ceiling, yeah. but it's all acoustically treated. But if you talk louder. You get a so little the, bit of room you, bounce. You hear the, hear the room. So mm-hmm. that's an important thing. But it sounds uh, natural. That's the beauty of it. Yeah, exactly. Like if you're doing a video game, you could back away from the mic and it would sound kind just of fine. okay because it's yeah. that's what they would, you know, I'm hearing actors find out from voiceover directors doing games. They'll say, can you please back away from your mic? And a lot of times the actor has a shotgun mic aimed right at him and they go way back here and they're like, uh, well, I I'm actually only have two feet to move. I can only go about this far away. <laughs> <laughs> so it doesn't work. You can't do that. So that's been kind of funny. Absolutely. Uh, let's see what that call is about. I don't okay. know. So I'm going to mute it. Okay, good. Dan, uh, your turn. Yes. Uh, my number three is setting levels. Uh, I mean, we talk about this every week because nobody seems to understand it. You know, those of us that came out of broadcasting, and sat there in front of the board, and you know we had the uh, where's my view meter? I know it's here somewhere. I probably the got meter. knocked over when we were. Oh, here it is. This guy. Keep it handy for just such an emergency, as Bughorn Leghorn once said. Um, view meter. It's the thing about it is, is that what we use today is the exact same thing. It's just digital. This is different scale. Thing. Yeah. Right. But you know, it goes up if you you don't want to go above zero, but you want to modulate. Probably. And, and I think this is, you know, after years and years and years of really listening to people's audio and seeing what they do, you want to at least consistently modulate to minus nine and peak somewhere between minus six and minus four to make it even easier on the on the digital VU meter, always in the green, always in the yellow with an occasional flash of red or if you're on audacity, a flash of orange. Yeah, don't uh, freak out if it t- taps into the red meter once second, in a while. Yeah. That red people sometimes people think that red means dead or clipping. Right. No, it's it's zero that's clipping. Right. So if you don't go that high, it's not going to be a problem. Uh, but setting that and and what you do on your interface is try and find the sweet spot on your interface where that's going to you know where you're going to be consistently doing that. On the Scarlets, they've got that great little halo around the. Uh, the gain dial that, you know, always keep it in the green. And if you occasionally a little flash of red, it'll be fine. Um, you know, and again, the meters in your software are going to be in there. Learn to use that. Always in the green, always in the yellow with a little bit of flash of red. That that simplifies it down. And as long as people consistently do that, your level should not be an issue. You want to have a nice fat signal going in. Uh, you know, that's what engineers want. You know, we had Mark Rao on last week and he was talking about don't do any processing or anything. We'll talk about that in a second. What's your number four? My number four is dealing with proper ventilation, how it requires a large return feed in addition to the air coming in, even in a larger space, to maintain temperature. I learned this the hard way on a couple of studios where the ventilation was set up to bring in cool air or bring bring in air, but it would stop cooling. And there's a reason why that happens. Now, what I didn't realize was that looking in most residences, you only see an inlet in the room. There's only most rooms in a bedroom, for example, you'll see a vent in the ceiling. 
but there's no return. Yeah, the gold is so, usually in like one or two places. In the, in yeah, the so place. how do they do that? And then they figured out, oh, it's because there's a gap underneath all the doors, and that's how the air escapes under the door and into the return. Well, when you have a soundproof, airtight space, <sighs> that doesn't work that way. And, it, and so if you really want efficient cooling or good air circulation, you have to have a return, a way for the air to get back out. And if you want it to be as quiet as possible, that return should be rather large. Bigger than the inlet. So I learned that uh, over the years and have helped to make some better ventilation as a result. Right. Dan, what's your number? Well, well, yeah. And the intake always needs to be at the floor and the ex the exhaust needs to be near the ceiling. Yeah, because you want that hot, stale air to go out the top. Yeah. That's that's an important one to learn because we've seen people build booths where the, the circulation is completely reversed. Why is it so hot in here? Mm-hmm. Uh, when to use processing is my number four. Uh, you know, and, and as Mark Grau said last, you know, last week, never, uh, you know, depending on what it is you're doing for auditions, get it right up front. Because remember, most of the time people are listening to your auditions on your iPhone, on their iPhone or their iPad or on their laptop or something like that. It's not they're not being always listened to in some big studio with, you know, with 20 inch speakers or whatever. Um, so don't overprocess your audio, if at all. Everybody's talking about RX, you know, eight, uh, and and all these different things that they use. And then I always ask that question, why? Yeah, you better know why you're using it if you're using it. Exactly. Why? Uh, do you know how it works? Uh, and do you know when to use it? And do you and, know when to do you know when it sounds bad? Yes. That's a good question for a lot of people. Do you know when your your noise reduction tools sound bad? Well, yeah, and, and usually it, it becomes pretty obvious. Uh, it's always fascinating, though, that people don't hear background noise because it's usually something that's always going on in their place of residence. Yeah. Always, a refrigerator, for starters, you know. You I don't call think it ear blind. I call yeah. it ear blindness. <laughs> yeah. I mean, literally what it is is your brain has a mixer console in it, and if it's and something gets annoying, it's like, I'm, I'm potting down that noise. If you're lucky. Let's put yeah. it that way. Not everybody has that part of their brain. <laughs> exactly. What's your number uh, five? Well, I have found that um, back to this kind of dovetails with mic placement and stuff, but sitting down in a low ceiling booth, which if you have anybody with a prefabricated booth is almost always going to have a pretty low ceiling, um, it really improves the sound. And likewise, if you can raise the ceiling of your room, which is far less likely, then you'll be able to do that. It also improves the sound. So we often worry so much about what's on the sides, in front of us, the sides, and what how that's treated. And then we forget about the ceiling. And I'll whisper rooms with my punching bag tonight. That's okay. They can handle it. They're, they're advertising on YouTube. I see their pre-roll ads all the time. They're okay. Um, the ceiling on, in a whisper room only has like an inch of foam on it. And then it's just wood. And those are notoriously resonant and boomy when you're, st- when you're up near the ceiling. So if you're having that issue, sit down on a stool or get a tall stool at least. At least try to lower yourself at least five, six inches if you can, if not more. And notice how much better it sounds. Have you found that to be true too, too Dan? Yeah, I'll, I'll do that with people. You know, if, you know, I'll go in their closet or wherever it is, their booth, whatever they've set up. And I will go up and down and I'll say, talk standing up fully erect and then sort of squat down and listen to how it changes the sound. In, How's the sound in, now? It, uh, it's a little distant, uh, but very resonant. I, <laughs> you know, I always like, you know, you sound like you're in a tube. Are you talking to the right side of the mic? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> that that, I, that uh, should be number one. Are you talking to the right side of the mic? Why does it sound so far away? Oh man. Anyway, but um, yeah, I, I I find that uh, yeah, you've got to be able to you know where your sweet spot in your booth is. Uh, let's see, my number five. Uh, well, I you know I wanted to talk a little very quickly about the things that we've learned from doing this show. Which Ooh. Is, <laughs> Which, How much more time? We I, could do I mean, the whole that's, show that's, on that's that. That's a big book right yes, there. Yes, it is. I mean, we've gone through so many oh. different different platforms to do this show. We started with, with Telestream. Yeah, I think we started Ustream, with Ustream. Ustream and Ustream's Telestream. online thing. It was just like a website. Right. Then we went to Ustream Pro. Right. Which was an application. Right. Then we went to Telestream web, uh, Wirecast, which was 
what Ustream Pro actually was built out of. Right. And it was cool, had a lot of nifty tools, but we had so many technical problems, cr- right. weird problems. Yeah. So from Wirecast, which was all Mac based, we took a huge shift and went to vMix. vMix. We and built that runs the on Beast. A Windows. PC. It runs on a PC. And we had a custom built PC just to run the show. And I will say, because it was custom built for that job, very carefully, we very carefully picked the components. It's still running beautifully and we suspect it will. But we're not using it now, are we, Dan? No, because now we're using <laughs> StreamYard, which is StreamYard. super duper. So I can sit at my desk and do this. Don't have to put up a, all this stuff. And We are using it, StreamYard. I, yeah, it makes it a lot easier. So anyway, we've got you know a couple minutes left in this segment. You had a story you wanted to talk about, you know, aside from the fact that you know we've been doing this for ten years and we can go on and on about that. Yeah. But you've you have a fun little story about about uh, the Don, if if you want. The Don, the Don. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. I was stumbling around on LinkedIn. Um, Brent Allen Hagel, who's a very good uh, trailer voiceover producer. Um, had a great story posted on there because he had just recorded a demo for Sky, which is Don's youngest daughter. And um, is that right, Sky? Yes, Lisi is the older one. Yes, so Sky. And uh, she was getting rich. She was cutting her demo. And I was like, oh, that is so cool. That is so cool to hear. And just in the conversation, in the chat, I, I typed up a little story and I thought this would be fun to share. Um, oh, he was saying how he recorded... Uh, sky through a manly cardioid reference mic and a manly vox box preamp and he said i did that on purpose because that's what her dot her dad recorded on which i thought was really really fun and then i said you know what don lothentain he would have loved the manly vox box i am sure um when i first worked in the studio he didn't have a preamp at all he had his manly cardioid reference or reference cardioid uh, tube microphone plugged directly, well, through a cable in the ceiling and all this other stuff into a massive Mackie 32 by eight mixer. You've seen them in venues all the time in bars, you know, for bands, this big thing. And uh, it was picking up RF like crazy RFI interference, a buzz, uh, at night. And I realized it was from the dimmer panel that in his studio that controls all of the lighting in the house. The entire house had this massive electronic dimmer system, super high tech, especially for when that house was built. I mean, way ahead of its time. But the problem was that that thing was right behind the mixing console and we were getting all kinds of crazy buzz. So I was working for a boutique pro audio dealer that sold tube tech brand stuff. I think it's made in Denmark or something. And so I got him a tube tech channel strip. And a year or two later, I discovered that his manly mono mic preamp, which was like their one channel, very simple mic preamp that they, I believe, still make, um, it was in the gear graveyard, aka his sauna. <laughs> <laughs> he actually, I just, I've seen the door to the sauna many times. But I never looked in there, and he said, "Go check in the sauna." He was looking for his record player one time, <laughs> and there it was the manly two preamp was sitting in there. I was like, "Wait a minute!" I took it home. A uh, little bit of research to thought, well, it might be a bed, dead tube. It was. I replaced that tube, but we never reinstalled it in the studio because, well, the tube tech was working great. So we just kept using it. Um, now that mic preamp actually lives in the SAG Foundation Don LaFontaine voiceover lab. It's in the rack. It's in the, bo- in, in the console there. Um, and maybe you can even get to use it if you're in there. Um, but, you know, here's the, here's the wrap on this whole thing. It's funny, had he not had a tube preamp, which we always tell you guys, no. don't use one. If he hadn't had one um, that had subsequently had a failed tube and then Don had to figure out what to do, so he sort of patched around it, um, he wouldn't likely have, I wouldn't have likely been called into his studio in the first place by uh, engineer Steve Nafshin. I never would have been asked to come in and fix it. And then I would have never met Don and his family. So thanks, Manly. Yeah. Thanks for making tube equipment and thanks for having something that had to fail so that I had to be called in. It was fate, I guess. In a sauna. In a sauna. <laughs> <laughs> That's great. <laughs>
<laughs> I have to remember to tell that I always we see at the trade shows we see Ivana Manley and all these other vendor uh, owners at their booths, and I'm sure she would get a kick out of that story. So really. I'll have to tell All right. You. Well, we got a ton of questions uh, that have been written in and people on Clubhouse, and we yep. want to get to those. So we're going to take a break and we will get to all those fabulous questions that we love to answer right after these messages. Hi, this is Bill Farmer, and you are watching Voice Over Body Shop. It's great. Let's face it. If you're a voice talent, not everyone in your family or close friends really understands what you need for your home voiceover studio. You want a what? Well, VoiceOverEssentials.com has the perfect answer when it comes to birthdays and other gift-giving for us voiceover folk. New for the first time ever, after countless requests, VoiceOverEssentials.com is thrilled to offer the VoiceOver Essentials gift card. You pick the amount you want to give, and they take care of the rest. The recipient will receive an email with their digital gift card and gift code to use on anything they offer on voiceoveressentials.com. Give them or give yourself the gift of getting exactly what you want, like the Harlan Hogan VO1A microphone, the Portabooth Pro or Plus, Harlan Hogan Signature Series voiceover optimized headphones. A lot of what? Go to voiceoveressentials.com and click on Shop and Gift Cards and choose the amount. Gift cards now at voiceoveressentials.com. Thanks, Harlan. Well, hello there. I bet you weren't expecting to hear some big voiced announcer guy on your new orientation training for Snapchat, were you? Stick around. You don't want to miss this. Power 1039. At Target, we want you to come as you are. Be comfortable. Uh, okay, maybe not bathrobe comfortable. Pants for the customer in aisle four, please. Nuevo México necesita un cambio. La representante Michelle Lujan Grisham ha luchado por nuestro estado en la Cámara de Representantes. Watch anywhere, anytime on an unlimited number of devices. Sign in with your Netflix account to watch instantly at Netflix.com. The ice cream maker is a big risk that can have huge rewards until you forget to turn it on. Well, that's it, guys. Time is up. Hey, it's JMC. Thanks for watching the voiceover body shop. If you're demo ready or looking to get there, check out jmcdemos.com and see a sample of our work. Now let's get back to Dan and George and this week's tech wisdom. Well, it's that time of the show where we get to thank our lovely sponsors, Source Elements, the creators of Source Connect, which they created so long ago, at least 15 years ago, back when ISDN reigned supreme. Well, I'm here to tell you, ISDN essentially is dead. It doesn't mean the technology is not in, no longer functioning, but it has pretty much left the production voiceover world because, well, all the last year during the pandemic, everybody went home, including the engineers and the producers. So they didn't have their fancy ISDN hardware boxes and ISDN line connections because they weren't at home. So Source Connect really stepped in uh, as the heir apparent. And so for that reason, you should definitely consider getting at least up and running with it to the point where you're comfortable with it. The beauty of it is you don't necessarily have to buy it outright. You can do a subscription or you could even just do a couple of day pass to test it out or use it for that big session. Um, but if you want to get going, you really want to get a good start. Uh, get off on the right foot. Go to georgethe.tech slash SC to get my uh, my little kickstart on how to get it up and running because yes there's quite a few steps involved and you want to get off on the right foot i got a video on there you can get up and running and learn more quickly how to use it um but i would recommend you get going on that because it really shows that you're playing on a higher level and just we also want to make sure your studio is ready so let us know send us a sound check and or a, a, a specimen cup drop in dan's specimen cup so we can know for sure that your audio quality is ready for Source Connect. Anyway, thanks again, Source Elements. Let's get to those questions. Yeah. Hi, this is Carlos Ellis Rocky, the voice of Rocco, and you're watching Voice Over Body Shop. And we're back. And we're back. And we're back. All righty. Well, tons of questions here, uh, which is what we love because we want to hear from you guys. That's what makes the show work. Uh, let's start with uh, Jeff Holman has a question you wanted to bring up. Yeah, because uh, this was something that came up on, on a Facebook group, and it was a really good question. I think that's where it was. 
And so I, here we go. Um, he said, I upgraded to the latest version of Twisted Wave and now none of my RX7 effects come up with in the correct window. So he couldn't see them. Um, they all come up with a basic window with nothing in it. So the plugin window loads and there's no RF, RX window in there. Uh, when I try to use mouse, mouth to click, uh, the window, there's no sensitivity fader, there's no controls, nothing. Um, also, I don't see a preview button, a compare button option. Uh, it's just, they're, they're gone. Um, I only get a generic window with the options preset, merge, tail drop, and play. Uh, apply and apply and close, that's it. Um, what happened? How do I get my RX-7 effects to work in Twisted Wave again? What has happened? Has this happened to anybody else? Now, Here's where the details get very important. I'm running the latest version of Twisted Wave 25.2 on Big Sur on an M1 MacBook Air. Thanks everyone. Now, this would have taken me a while to, 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 to debug. I don't think it would have been in any way obvious to me. I would have probably told him to go off to Isotope to get this troubleshooted. And there were a lot of comments that were mostly wrong until one fellow popped up with the right one. So I wanted to give credit where credit's due. And it was from Glenn Gutierrez. Gutierrez. And Glenn says, if you want to run plugins that are not optimized for Apple Silicon or your M1 Mac, yet you need to run Twisted Wave in Rosetta mode. I discovered this with Ozone, which is also by Isotope. Um, I had to quit Twisted Wave. I did get info on the app. And then when I opened get info, I see a little checkbox open using Rosetta and that fixed the problem. And I tried this myself and right on the money because Twisted Wave is now 25.2 is now natively for Silicon. It means it breaks plugins that are made for Intel. So you got to watch out for that. At least there is a very feasible workaround until all those other plugin companies catch up. So that was a, that was a golden one. Well, yeah. way, way well played there, Glenn. Yeah, I, I I find people rely so much on these plugins. You know, it's like this plugin's great, that plugin's great. Yeah, but what's wrong with your sound that you need a plugin? You know, I mean, if I mean, if you're doing audiobooks and all those other things, clearly you've got to have you know that type of processing. But it's very very specific what you need, and all these exotic things. None of this stuff was designed for voiceover. It's all designed for making music. You know, yeah. so if you're watching the Grammys last night, it's like, well, that's what you use that for. That's what you use that for. Not for voiceover. Keep it clean. The biggest trouble for people is is once they have a tool like this and it becomes part of their flow, and then all of a sudden they have to do a Source Connect session. If they've been leaning on post processing tools to get the audio to to up to spec, they're going to be in trouble. So they yeah. got make sure you're not only relying on that to get the quality where you need to be. Let's go to Clubhouse. Clubhouse. Hey, oh, Clubhouse. Danny. Danny, what's going on? All right, we got Shannon O'Brien from San Diego, California. Shannon, you're up. Hey, Shannon. Hi. Oh, hello. How you guys, Dan, George? Thank you so much for all you do, Danny. Thanks for bringing me up. Uh, just quick question uh, for Source Connect. Does it need to be hardwired through an Ethernet cable, or is Wi-Fi acceptable? It depends. I, I have an analogy for that. <laughs> Go for it. Do you need to wear a seatbelt when you drive a car? <laughs> and yes. I, yes, and I use that I use that analogy because could you drive your car and get from A to B without a seatbelt on? Of course. Um, would you prefer that you had one on at the moment something went wrong? Yes. Um, that's how it kind of goes when you're using Wi-Fi. It may work beautifully in every test that you've done, and every time you've talked to your friend who's a voice actor with Source Connect, and you chatted and said, "Oh, it's working great," and then that big session comes up, and then halfway through, it starts dropping out like crazy at random because the kid across the street fired up his brand new super mega <laughs> killer Wi-Fi router that blasts the whole neighborhood <laughs> with too much energy, and your Wi-Fi goes crazy. So. Yes, it is highly, highly recommended. In fact, I'm pretty sure some productions mandate it. I think they will actually tell you if you're ready for the session, you are hardwired and port mapped, which is another thing they recommend as well. But the, the Ethernet connection is really preferable for low stress source connect sessions. Yeah, I, I was talking with Robert Marshall from Source Elements a couple of weeks ago. We were set, you know, resetting the uh, our Source Connect here. He knows stuff. Yeah, he knows that a guy. thing or two, you know, and it, and it helps to know people. 
but you know he's like okay let's do the port forwarding on this and he goes are you running into a uh, you know into your into a modem well it's like you know my wi-fi modem is there another modem that goes directly to the internet I'm like yeah plug it into that didn't need to do anything suddenly yeah, it was he's like, patched around the router yeah. exactly and that and that worked really well the thing is is with the wi-fi you've got to open up all these gates to make sure it goes through. And that's and that's why you need to do that. The, there's a question here from Amanda Brandt uh, that I, 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 I know I can answer. She says, uh, can you do ADR for a big production studio in your home studio or just in a determined location studio? I'm not sure what a determined Good question. Location. Okay. Well, hmm. we, I know that for a fact because uh, my son Jacob was dubbing a, a movie for HBO the last couple of weeks. And, uh, you know, because of COVID, my, we, we didn't want to be going into a studio. And they're like, well, if you have a home studio, we can do that. Oh, well, we just happen to have a home studio here. Isn't it and nice I, to say, yes, I have yes. one. <laughs> and, and ran, you know, this microphone into a Scarlet because the, the road didn't do very well with what their system was. But uh, just a clean line and... You know, they, they run the uh, the video on Zoom and the direction on Zoom, and they just record it. You can see them stop and go, okay, we can nudge it over just a little bit. And you can hear what you can see what's going on. But yeah, you can you can do it at home if you've got a good sounding home studio. They're going to want to check it, of course, to make sure it's up to their standards. So. All, All right. right. Back Let's to the clubhouse. clubhouse. Who we got, Danny? Coast to coast, reporting from New York, Tori and Brackett. Torian. Yeah. Torian. Hey, George and Dan. Great to officially virtually meet you both. Fabulous. You too. Welcome. Yeah. Um, so I'm wondering, because so when we plug in our mics to our interfaces for our computers, you can usually adjust the, the recording level, right, on, the, on your DAW, on your computer settings. But you can right. also adjust the gain on your interface, your DAW, wherever you do that. So I was wondering right. if we could talk about the difference between the two and you know, why we even have the option because they seemingly have the same function. Mm. That's Not a pretty exactly. good question. Yeah, yeah. go. Yeah, Dan. Yeah, well, okay. So the, the gain dial here, you know, say on a 2i2 uh, is usually right next to the mic where you plug the mic in. And, the, you know, if you've got a two channel, it's going to be, you know, channel one if you're plugged into channel one. We have found that, you know, on most units, if you set it to about three o'clock, that's a good place to start. Uh, you know, as you can see, I have it up there at about 75%. Because uh, remember, you know, most of this stuff was designed for making music. And when you're singing, you're singing a lot louder. And these interfaces and preamps don't have to drive as hard. For voiceover, when we're talking very quietly and using our indoor voice, you need to drive it a little bit more. Uh, so generally, if you're on a PC, you know, sometimes I say, you know, just set the, you know, the, the mixer level in the PC to 100%. And then adjust the gain from from your interface in, say, if you're using Audacity, you can adjust the level in there. But that also adjusts it, you know, from your from your OS, as I as I, I think is right. Yes, right? there's some lot of shenanigans on the Windows side, <laughs> <laughs> because uh, depending on what sound driver you're using, the Windows own sound control panel may affect your recording level. And. That's kind of the pro and con of Audacity. I don't like that it lets you override the recording level. Yeah, don't do that. But I do like that it does show you what the level is. It has that slider. So if it's out of whack, at least at a glance, you're going to see it in Audacity. You'll see if that thing is not at all the way to the right. So make sure you're doing all of your gain adjustments uh, during the recording from the preamp or from the interface. Really, that's what you want to do. Yeah. Okay. Quick question here that I can answer because it's addressed to me. Uh, for Dan, you with your M1 Mac Mini, which we are now listening to and watching me on right now. Uh, did you have to buy or, uh, any, or add anything to be able to connect things that use USB and HDMI connections? I know there's one HDMI on the new Mac Mini, but no USB ports. Well, there are USB ports. There's two USB. There's two regular USB ports, and then there are two uh, Thunderbolt uh, ports. What I, what, what I did... <laughs> Is uh, and this this one I think is actually broken, but um, you get a port with a Thunderbolt cable on it that goes into the back, and it gives you the ability to plug USB and other USB uh, stuff. This has actually three USB connections in it, mm -hmm. uh, and uh, I sort actually of a hub. yeah, I just bought a new hub 
that also has uh, an HDMI out on it. So now I have two mm-hmm. HDMI outputs and uh, more USB outputs. So yeah, you if unless you're unless you're not running a lot of peripherals, uh, you don't really need it. But because you like I said, you got two USB ports and you got two Thunderbolt ports. The Thunderbolt ports will carry all sorts of stuff. But if you're running a lot of stuff out of there, it only has a maximum. Um, oh. I happen to have the instruction card right here. Uh, it, it it will only put out uh, three amps max, so you've got to have you know you've got you may have to plug it in to your computer to get extra power, uh, and not into your computer into a, a power power board, supply yeah. into a power supply into a wall wart as you like. Three amps is quite a lot. Yeah, you have to be uh, running a lot of outboard gear to. Yeah, but if up. you are use you, you're gonna have to plug it in, but they give you the ability to do that. Well, I, I, I will chime in real quick and say that I, too, am running the show tonight on a Mac Mini M1. Um, this is really the maiden voyage of this computer live on a show. And uh, as we do, we just we just go for it. <laughs> There's, this is, there is no dry run. And uh, there was a few gotchas with some video capture issues. Like I had to get a different Ultra Studio recorder called the 3G, which uses Thunderbolt 3. Um, I had to, uh, what else did I have to do? Install one or two different programs and just the usual gotchas with the silicon. Like we found out earlier with Twisted Wave and plugins, there were things you're going to run into, but it's been working beautifully. I have an older, very early generation Thunderbolt 3 hub from OWC, Otherworld Computing. And uh, it's a little overkill because it's, well, it's a little overkill, but it does give me four USB ports another Thunderbolt port, um, an HDMI port, and I am using, well, actually I'm using a lot of them. I'm using dual HDMI monitors, one on the Mac Mini and then one plugged into the Thunderbolt. And so I'm getting to use two displays and it's working great. Now, if you're a total massive power user and you want to have three or four displays, you may have some limitations with the new M1s until the next generation comes out. But, um, it's been perfectly fine and put my hand on top. It's right in front of me. Now, let me put the mic at it, shall I? It should be dead silent. And it is. It doesn't make any sound at all. In fact, I put my hand on it and it's warm, so I know it's alive, but it's, it's not alive. in any way hot. It's really freakishly amazing. Anyway, we, we talked about that a lot. Yeah, Sorry. Freak, freak. Um, Chat room, uh, Clubhouse, actually. We got one more in the Clubhouse queue from Dustin, it looks like, Danny. And I'm using an M1 MacBook Pro, so there we go. Yeah, baby. I right. have a fan, however. All right. Yeah. All right, Dustin Frank from Las Vegas. You're up, Dustin. Yeah, and I'm on the fence about buying one. Um, so um, uh, George helped me a lot with my first audio book a couple years ago, and I've done several since then, so I want to thank you for that awesome. service. I've always been welcome. Made- made specs never had a problem since uh, uh using your video so i just wanted to ask i have a 416 to a scarlet solo to my mac mini i think it's a 2014. um i'd like to use my rig uh on clubhouse do you think i can connect into my phone is that what you're doing right now oh okay well you do need to get a lightning to trrs dongle um they may have included these with some of the earlier iPhones. I don't know. Maybe they didn't, but Apple has always sold one of these things. It's just another one of the many Apple dongles. Apple, the dongle company. That our drawers are filled with. <laughs> Here we go. And this this is literally what's being used. TRSS, I'm sorry. TRRS, or TRRS. So it's it's a mini connector. Like if if you have any older Apple AirPods, or not AirPods, the actual wired ones, the plug has a different kind of connector on it than a normal like headphone connector. It has a th- another ring. So it's tip, ring, ring, sleeve. It's got wow. four little metal rings, contacts. And that's the, the, so you need a cable that can speak that language and then get one of these little $30 uh, lightning adapter dongle boobabs. Mine's made by Mofi, I think. And, um, and then you need to, the tricky part with this, with the, uh, with connecting it to the um, uh, Scarlet is then you need to figure out another way to patch it into the microphone. It's, it's, it's not straightforward with the Scarlet because 
you can create what's called a mix minus with the Scarlet, and that is the ability to send audio out to Clubhouse, receive the audio from Clubhouse, but not have the audio from Clubhouse feed Clubhouse. <laughs> that's a loop. And that's a little bit challenging to do with Scarlet. But right. Dan and I and Danny and Dan and me, all three of us are using uh, Rodecaster Pro mixers, which have a built-in interface specifically to connect to a mobile device. And it works beautifully because it also has the USB, or oh, I'm sorry, the uh, mix minus circuit. Do you need a $600 mixer to do this? No, I'm sure there's some ways to hack it with some the right adapters and a little bit of bailing wire and chewing gum and experimentation. <laughs> but this is, this is the way we're doing it and it's pain free. So uh, if you're really serious about this, you wanna start hosting your own clubhouses and really make a go of it, having something like the Rodecaster Pro is a pretty wise, pretty wise move. Yeah, really. Yeah, there's yeah. some performance clubs that are fun that uh, it would be nice to have some mic technique ability rather than the old TikTok, but put it up to your mouth. Thing. Well, you know, but, you, uh, could, you could also try is the, uh, the Sentrance. Oh, there's a Zoom mixer that our producer, Sue, just mentioned, a Zoom. Uh, I think it's called the F8. Which Zoom is it, Sue? Tell me in my ear. Oh, she actually, you guys can hear her on the, on the uh, clubhouse, can't you? Um, and then I have a mic port. Pro 2 from Sentrance, and this will connect by lightning to your phone. But be careful, I've heard that not every device that has a lightning adapter will actually talk to Clubhouse. Hmm. So like the L8 got you, okay. Yeah, so not- busy with auditions. Yeah, not every one of these lightning, <laughs> lightning port devices will talk to Clubhouse. This is something you have to experiment with. But if you're using, the Apple adapter that I described earlier, it will work with Clubhouse. So have fun. Thanks. Good luck. Thanks, everyone. All, All right. Ready. On the list. What's up next? Let's see here. Um, Polaris 3000 here. This is uh, on the topic of setup at home. Does anyone here, that would be us, uh, have a good example or common traps to avoid for a person setting up their first home studio? Yes, rewind this show and go back for the 10 things that George <laughs> oh and I learned. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> True that. Yeah. On a home studio on a budget, again, acoustics are number one. You can avoid all sorts of problems if you set up in the right place. And there's no microphone and there's no digital interface, you know, un, you know, un, over, you know under $100 that's going to change the way you read copy. Uh, you know, <laughs> right. I mean, people are like, I got to get a, this microphone. I got to get this great piece of gear. It's not going to make you a better voice actor. And that's the most important thing with any home studio. You got to be good at what you're doing and then have someone professional show you and teach you how to do it exactly right uh, and get it set up right. Um, you know, following those those three basics that I talked about earlier, acoustics, mic technique and and setting proper levels. Uh, so as long as you've got a clean chain of, you know, a good mic and an interface and a good computer and the right program, there's not a whole lot else to it, except that your acoustics have to be really good. Very true. Yeah. The acoustics is like the lighting of audio. Absolutely. You can't expect a great professional looking photograph with crappy lighting. And just like that for voiceover, you can't expect a great sounding recording without good acoustics. Yeah. I, I love this last question that we got here, though from from Bla benson blake uh i'll let you read it and then we can both answer it <laughs> all right benson asks what's your take on using the cloud lifter to boost a mic signal should a 416 that's a condenser shotgun mic be plugged directly into the focus right scarlet with the volume up or boosted with a cloud lifter signal for a better uh for a better option for auditions and recording so dan what's your it, take on that it doesn't work um, you don't, you don't need something like that because the cloud lifter is designed really, and it was originally designed for ribbon mics, uh, to get, raise the gain on dynamic and ribbon mics, not active, uh, uh, studio condenser mics. Uh, so what you want to do is if you try to put that in line to a 416, the 416 will not sound anything because, there's no phantom power going into it. It doesn't pass phantom power. No, it doesn't. It. And therefore, you don't need it. 
Um, you know, if you had a, you know, if you're using an SM58 or something or an RE20, yeah, those are great for podcasting. And maybe if you use those for voiceover, I'm, I'm not a big fan of those. But no, you can't use a cloud lifter on a 416. And why would you want to? 416 has great output. And with any reasonable, you know, interface like a, a 2i2 or uh, an AGO3 from, from Yamaha or, you know, the audience or the, um, God, there's so many good ones out there. What's the cloud lifter for? It's for when you're, when you're using a ribbon mic. Oh, oh yeah. The, the, the lip mic. Or Maybe one of these shows, here. I will patch it in and we'll actually <laughs> listen to myself talking. If you want to see and hear these being used, at least see them being used. I'm not totally convinced you're hearing them. Yeah. Is on the show Ted Lasso. Oh, really? I started whenever, watching that last night. It's a great show. And whenever they go to a, a, a football match in, uh, in England, the announcers are on these, which is kind of fun to watch for us radio geeks. Yeah, but that's a ribbon mic, and they have very, very low output, and they really need the 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 boost of the cloud lifter. So that's why, if I ever use this mic, the cloud lifter is living in the case with it. <laughs> All righty, ten years we have been doing this show, and I think you know, if we do it another ten, I'll be seventy four years old. <laughs> wow. <So. laughs> Wow. But I'll still know what I'm talking about. We'll have USB ports, uh, USB 7 ports uh, wired into our brains by that time. That's true. Yes. Just plug in. Just, wow. <laughs> <All right. laughs> anyway, thanks for all your questions, guys. And thanks for being there on Clubhouse and watching the show every week. Uh, we're going to take a, another quick break here, and we will wrap things up and start the next 10 years right after this. This is the Latin lover narrator from Jane the Virgin, Anthony Mendez. And you're enjoying Dan and George on... The Voice of Everybody Shop. Hey there, it's David H. Lawrence, the 17th, with VO Heroes. And you may be watching Voice Over Body Shop, V-O-B-S, because you're interested in becoming a voice talent. And you looked around the internet, you found that this was a great place to come, and you're absolutely right. Um, but you don't have any of the knowledge yet as to how to get started. And I'd like to help you with that. I've got a free course online. You can take it anytime you want. It's called Getting Started in VoiceOver, and it walks you through the equipment you need, the business side of things, the actual categories of voiceover work that you'll likely be pursuing, and also the mindset that you need to have when you're getting started and moving into being successful at doing voiceover for a career. So if you're an actor or you're not an actor, you want a side grade from another business, you want to learn about voiceover, go to voheroes.com slash start. That's VOHeroes.com slash start for the VO Heroes Getting Started in VoiceOver class. And I'll see you there. In these modern times, every business needs a website. When you need a website for your voice acting business, there's only one place to go. Like the name says, VoiceActorWebsites.com. Their experience in this niche webmaster market gives them the ability to quickly and easily get you from concept to live online in a much shorter time. When you contact voiceactorwebsites.com, their team of experts and designers really get to know you and what your needs are. They work with you to highlight what you do. Then they create an easily navigable website for your potential clients to get the big picture of who you are and how your voice is the one for them. Plus, voiceactorwebsites.com has other great resources like their practice script library and other resources to help your voiceover career flourish. Don't try it yourself. Go with the pros. Voiceactorwebsites.com, where your VO website shouldn't be a pain in the you-know-what. Yep, this is VOBS. Proven anybody can have a show these days. All righty. And yes, back. anyone can have a show these days, thanks to technology like StreamYard and Clubhouse. Yeah. But it doesn't mean everybody should, should have a show. Just make sure you have a good, <laughs> make sure you have a point of view and you know what the hell you're talking about. Exactly. Exactly. All right. Well, um, let's see here. Uh, there was something about uh, a, an Apollo user survey. Yeah. So, you know, we've had this ongoing uh rant i guess you'd call <laughs> it your rant <laughs> in facebook there's a facebook group called universal audio apollo for vo 
And we've been reporting, uh, we've had a lot of reports of folks with technical issues with their Apollos. And I just thought it was one particular model I'm finding out now. There are more of you out there, not just one with the one twin model, uh, twin Mark II. If you want to kind of, uh, if you're frustrated by this and you want to be kind of like heard about this, we're trying to gather a survey of, of many of you. And I want to build a, build a nice database here and bring it all together to Universal Audio's higher ups, hopefully getting their attention and realize that this is not just user error or just random technical issues. It is actually a manufacturing problem that needs to be sorted out with some sort of a recall. So anyway, <laughs> if you want to be part of this, um, the easiest place to find it, because it's on Google Forms, um, is I, I put it a link to it on georgethe.tech slash Apollo dash UAD. So if you go to that page, uh, georgethe.tech slash Apollo dash UAD, you'll see a link to this form and please fill it out, even sending in your audio sample of whatever noise your equipment is making that it shouldn't be. And uh, we'll add you to this, um, I don't know if you want to call it a class. It's not really a class action, but we just wanted to get this information together Excellent. to deliver it and, and en masse. All righty. Uh, next week on this show, we'll, I'm, I'm going to come up with something. You know, we're, we're going to be off for Passover. So yeah. we're going to uh, I'll find a really good replay that perhaps a lot of you didn't see from last year or earlier this year. And uh, and then on April 5th, we have television producer Kevin Gershan will be here and he works with a lot of the top voiceover talent here in L.A. And I bet he has a lot of great stories about that. Uh, who are our donors this week? Our donors. Uh, we've got quite a few. Um, a couple new names that we haven't read that often. Noreen Reardon. Uh, Eddie Faria. Eddie Faria, with all caps. <laughs> Graham Spicer. Michael. Um, Michael. Michelle. What's my problem? Michelle Blanker. Michelle Christopher Blanker. Epperson. Sarah Borges. And Antland Productions. Thank, Thank you, everyone, for your donations. All right. Again, if you need help with your home studio, you can go to georgethe.tech or That's right. and you can head over and visit dan at homevoiceoverstudio.com all righty uh we need to thank our amazing sponsors tonight of course harlan hogan's voiceover essentials voiceover extra source elements voheroes.com voice actor websites.com and jmc demos uh, our thanks to Jeff Holman in the chat room tonight, doing a great Yay. job. Dan Danny Burnside working with us in Clubhouse tonight. Thank you very much, Danny. That was great. Uh, thanks, made, Danny. Ma made it sound like a real radio show. And, of course, our amazing technical director, Sue Molino, for keeping it nice and tight and making it easy for me to edit it later tonight. Uh, and, of course, Lee Penny, simply for being Lee Penny. Well, you know, it's not an easy business. You know, Don't be intimidated by the technology, but it really comes down to this. If it sounds good, it is good. I'm Dan Leonard. And I'm George Whittem. And this is VoiceOver. Body Shop. Or VO. B. B. S. Tech Talk. Tech Talk. Tech Talk. Tech Talk. Tech Talk. See you next time, guys. Have a good, good night. night.